Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art and Talk. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk. If you've been watching Art and Talk for a while, you know Art and Talk is all about meeting artists and being inspired. If you're new to Art and Talk, welcome. On our show, we aim to dive into the mind and heart of each of our guest artists to gain wider insight and a wider perspective into their art, their message, and their process. So today we're officially bringing you our first guest artist from the Art Acquisitions Exhibit, which is currently on view at the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County in Lake Worth Beach, Florida. We hope you've had a moment to check out our recent interview with Ellen Lyman, which officially kicked off the Art Acquisitions series that we're bringing to you. So the Art Acquisitions Exhibit spans across multiple art mediums and it opens a conversation for artists and collectors to think about, learn, define, and assess their appreciation for art. All right, so today we're bringing you an amazingly talented artist. He's a portrait artist and we'll be looking at some of his amazing portraits and diving of course into his artistic journey. So again, thank you for being with us. I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Serge Strasberg. Hi, Serge, welcome. Hi, Leslie, thank you for having me. Oh, we're, we're so delighted and happy to have you here. So there's so much territory that I'd like to cover in, in your amazing portraits. Um, perhaps we could start with, um, you've had a lot of classical training in Europe. I'm wondering, Serge, if you could share with us what some of that experience was like and how that helped to shape your artistic vision and your technique and your focus in your art. Okay, well, I, I lived 20, for 20 years in the US, 25 years in Paris and the rest in Belgium and the, in the UK. Uh, my training was in Paris. I was very lucky to um, study in Paris at a school which was one of the three main schools in Paris where Gauguin went, Bonnard went, and Matisse as well. And it's called Académie Julian, and it still exists today. And it's a very, very serious um, school uh, that teaches academic drawing, academic sculpture, graphic design, photography. You basically have the full spectrum of every artistic discipline. And I was lucky to study there under some pretty famous um, artists. So I studied there, but I also went to take classes of morphology, which is basically learning about muscles and bones. Uh, and I did that at the Beaux-Arts, which is the second most famous school in Paris. Uh, the third one being um, Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs. So I went to the, basically the two most famous schools in Paris and over there I learned to draw and I was very bad in uh, figure. <laughs> Actually the school tried to fail me. It was, and I promised myself that I would not fail. And I, I bought a book of Norman Rockwell and every morning for a year, I would wake up and draw for one hour, copy a Norman Rockwell drawing, which of course is hyper-realistic. And I eventually passed and I became the best one in my class in new drawing. And now I'm doing portraits. Um, and then after school, I became an illustrator. I published and wrote several books, um, including a bestseller about Darwin and the origin of species sold in five countries, uh, translated, um, sold for 60,000 copies, I think, across the world. So I did that for six years and I decided to go into portraiture. So I spent some time in the UK, in London. I had an agent there who was also working for Marlborough Gallery and the Graver Gallery. And I found a lot of clients in London, in Hampstead and in Oxford. Um, and there I started doing portrait, oil portraits uh, on site. So I would actually go to people's houses and paint a portrait from life, which, is, which can be quite challenging and intimidating for both the painter and the sitter, of course. 
I had dogs like eating my brushes. It was, it was a lot, <laughs> it was pretty interesting. Or clients eating peanuts while I was painting them. You know, there's a lot of juicy, funny stories to, to say about it. Or a woman divorcing and trying to seduce him while she was posing for a portrait and having three hours of makeup with a makeup artist before every session. So meanwhile, I, I perfected my technique with uh, a German expressionist painter from Berlin, an old man who taught me the technique of oil and egg tempera. Uh, and oil and egg tempera is really the technique used by the German expressionist painters. Some contemporary, American contemporary artists like John Curran, I believe used the same technique, but it's very rare and it's very hard to use. And it takes many, many, many years to, to learn how to use it and master it and making it fabricating the, the medium is really like chemistry. And I forgot to tell you that before going to art school, I was a chemistry major. I, in, I went to Grinnell College in Iowa with a scholarship and I learned organic chemistry. So, you know, now I'm a painter and I use all, all this knowledge to, you know, to try to get the essence of people on canvas and you know, either commission work or figurative painting that I, where I choose the models and that, that's where I am today. So portraits are your, your main subject matter and you've had quite an unfoldment as, as you've been uh, sharing with us of your art, artistic, um, first of all, classical training and, and the many doors that, that have uh, opened for you. Um, to, to really gain a, a sophisticated and a refined exposure and experience in, into art, the art world, and, and of course, um, with your great skill and your talent. And I have to just mention that I really appreciate, Serge, that you mentioned that initially, um, and it, it's almost hard to actually conceive and believe that you actually um, had any um, issues with, with drawing initially, looking at your um, amazing uh, portraits. I, I, I was bad at nude drawing. This is what I, this is what I did when I, you know, when I learned how to paint. <laughs> I actually, you know, this is a nude that I painted. That's so that, that's what I could do afterwards. But I, re I really was the worst in the class. And, and, and so I hope they could just give some hope <laughs> to most art students. Uh, you know, never give up, never, never listen. Never listen to most teachers because you know they. Some teachers are not happy and they try to break you, and because they are frustrated themselves, you know, they may not have succeeded as much as they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was a teacher as well at some point, but I gave that up because I, I felt like I could make it in, in the art world, and I did. And. I didn't think this was, this might have helped me at the beginning, just to gain from experience from students, but after a while, I didn't feel like it was really helping me. And I felt like I helped enough, enough people that I could, uh, you know, move on. Let's go into some of the very fascinating ways that you describe yourself um, as a portrait painter. You mentioned that uh, you feel that you're a universalist painter. Can you share with us what that means? Yes, I mean, you know, I basically, I am an immigrant painter because I was born in Belgium. I lived in Paris, but I have, I'm an American citizen. I spent 20 years of my life here. Um, I am Jewish, ident identify as Jewish, but I can easily be mistaken for Latino or for, you know, a Moroccan or an Indian or a Persian or a Colombian or a Brazilian. And therefore I can feel, you know, what, what a brown skinned person would feel, but I am a complete dichotomy because I live on the island of Palm Beach. I, I, I feel like I am privileged. You know, I may, I may not be as privileged as some people on the island for sure, but I, I feel I'm privileged. Um, and therefore I can understand what, you know, minorities feel, even though they will tell me they, that I wouldn't understand, but I, I do because I, I I face discrimination as a Jew in Europe. I know what it is. My family, uh, a quarter of my family died in the Holocaust. So I know what it is. But I, I think diversity really, 
And maybe that's a very naive thought of mine. And I respect everybody who's trying to defend an identity. But first of all, I don't think art should be only about identity. I think art should be judged for art, you know, and, and there's some great artists who also talk about identity, but it shouldn't be only about that. It should really be about the art. A universalist, because I traveled, I lived in so many places. I met so many people from different, from every stripe, every color. I have many friends among the gay community in New York. Most of my friends were gay and, and you know, I, same in Paris, uh, but I'm straight. And so it doesn't, you know, I even worked with a gay guy. We, we formed a tandem, it's called Strasbourg Mandel. And we were very successful. We sold it, you know, so one piece of $35,000, a portrait of Prince. Uh, so a universalist, because I, I, I look at people's souls. I look at, you know, who they are. And I don't, I'm not so much concerned about I, I'm not interested that much or about their identity or where, you know, everybody has a story to tell. Everybody has, everybody's family had problems or, or you know, some have been in a war, some have been, uh, you know, faced discrimination. So I look at the whole, the entire scope of humanity. And so I paint really people from, I just showed you a portrait of a Chinese woman who was naked. Uh, this, I have another example to show you right here. Uh, um, this is a, a guy who uh, identified as Jewish, but he wasn't really Jewish. He was just telling this because he thought he could get some favors from me, but I really didn't care. So, you know, I, I really paint all kinds of people, every color, every nationality, uh, white, black, green, it doesn't matter to me. It's more about if a person speaks to me, if they, if I find them interesting and they have an interesting story and they're also willing to connect with me because a lot of people don't open up. They don't, you know, they don't want to be painted. They don't want a portrait of themselves. So they, they have this invisible glass between me and them. And so, you know, there's no connection like, like someone would say. So there's, it's difficult to have a portrait done with somebody, you know, who doesn't connect with you. And then there's also plastic surgery. <laughs> and some people, they've done so much plastic surgery that it's hard to read them, to read what they're thinking. As a, as a portrait artist, you really have to speak to them a lot and try to get to know them, to understand, you know, because character, and this is something I learned in morphology class, you get the face that you deserve, it means, after a while, your character starts showing on your face. And if, if you've been a person who was very unhappy or, or complaining a lot, you start seeing muscles on the face, <laughs> unless there's extensive plastic surgery. But there's certain muscles that correspond, you know, that you use a lot when you're smiling, when you're sad. And so, so that's why I say, I, I don't know if it's the right word, universalist, because English is not my first language. It's, it's actually French, uh, but I, I think I'm all about diversity, but diversity as a whole, not just certain groups. That's, that's what I mean by that. I'm interested in all of humanity. I embrace all of humanity. Yes, I think that was a wonderful explanation uh, so we can get um, really clear insight, Serge, in, into like your mind, your heart, and, and your whole kind of orientation into your art. So it's really transcending identity, as, as you've been saying, and really looking at more of a, a whole or unified perspective is what I'm getting to see the, the humankind as, as a whole. Right. And really grabbing the essence of, of who they are uh, within your portraits. Mm -hmm. And the emotional aspect or the emotional quality of your subjects that you paint can you, can you touch upon that and, and bringing that out in your portraits before we take a look at um, some more of your of slides? Well, I think it's, you know, it's very therapeutic for, the, for both the painter and the sitter. Uh, I, I've done many portraits from life, which is pretty unusual. Most artists today, they project a photo, you know, and they never meet the person. 
I can still paint from life. And I, and I really enjoy painting from life because I get to know people better and I get to, I get to feel their energy. I, I get, you know, I, it's, very, it's a very different experience than just, you know, having a photograph, which is flat, no matter how good the photograph is, it's still flat. And it's it, and you don't see all the layers. You don't feel the, the vibe. You don't feel the energy from a picture. You don't. It, you know, there's no way. Um, it's very hard. Very hard. Some pictures I would say are moving so by major photographers, like Avedon, for example. For me, it's one of my, or uh, Nan Golden is also one of my favorite photographers because there's a lot of emotion in it. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard with photography. So. Um, a lot of these models or sitters or people who commission paintings, they, they, they commission me because they trust me. They put their trust in me. And I get to meet them and I get to spend a lot of time with them. And, and, and many times these are, these are already friends of mine. So they already, you know, we're already in a safe environment, safe territory. So for example, um, this is a portrait. Um, it's a friend of mine. This is a quick watercolor study but this is a guy I know very well so I you know there was no there were no issues between us they went very well um so that was a portrait of my friend Matt um this is also this is a friend who commissioned me a portrait of his wife uh, who used to be a Victoria secret model um so all kinds of people uh, in the back is a portrait of my son. So obviously I know them very well. <laughs> I have twin boys, you know, they're very, uh, they're, they're best friends. And they also, you know, we have a love relationship, obviously. And also a lot of complicity because I'm their dad and I'm the only guy in the house. So there's a lot of complicity. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of relationship I have with, um, Either people commission me portraits or people that I choose to paint. Uh, you know, all kinds of people. I had one one guy who commissioned a painting for me was my dentist, for example. <laughs> Another one was a judge who I who I actually met in a swimming pool. Can you imagine? <laughs> and then the courthouse commissioned me a portrait of him. So it, it you know it's really it's really interesting for me, and I, I really would like to write a book about this whole all these experiences, but I also have to be careful because I, you know, it's very personal, uh, but I think it's really worth telling all these stories in a book. One day uh, this will happen with, you know, Mr. X and Mrs. Y. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be really fascinating for, for many people. I think it's very interesting. Uh, one show I had was called the Dorian Gray Syndrome exhibition where I painted a lot of many people from New York City and some of them looked like models on the outside, but I was able to, to show how frail, how fragile they were also. So you would see the two sides of it. You, you know, you would see the, the soul behind the, behind the mask. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's so beautiful. And I, I love this whole intertwine of, you know, looking at things from, you know, almost like a, a psychological perspective, a, a human, you know, heart and soul level. And, you know, you're, you're, you pull from so many vast experiences um, with, with your training and your interaction with people um, and looking at really that, that sense of connection. You know, it, it's almost like you wear many hats. Like, yes, you're um, a proficient fine art portrait painter, but you dive deep into your subject matter and, you know, painting, you know, from life is just a, a whole experience in and of itself. And I think that's so amazing that, that you do that. And you really almost like wearing this hat to, to dive into as an artist, you know, to almost like step into their shoes and, and feel what's going on with them at, at a deeper level beyond the physical, beyond the identity as you said before, and, and really kind of tap into that essence and bring that energy and aliveness. And, and I think realness and authenticity, authenticity as you perceive it into your work as well. Thank you. I think, I think I'm, I'm often misunderstood and especially in the present times, you know, many people criticize male artists for objectifying 
uh, women or, or just criticize figured opinions for objectifying people. But, you know, what I, I, I feel like I, more than a voyeurist, I, I really feel like I'm putting people on a pedestal on the contrary, I'm making them feel better. I, I, I am making them feel, that's what they tell me. So I, I think, you know, I, I don't think it's the right description for me, like to, you know, to say that I'm objectifying people. On the contrary, I think I'm de-objectifying people. <laughs> I think it's quite the opposite. Uh, this, this was a, uh, I wanted to show you this one also. So this was done in Paris and this was a French actress. And, and I, I kind of put on canvas what she told me she was feeling. She was feeling jealousy. She was very lonely. And so in the background, um, there's, a, there's, a, paint, there's a, a couple kissing that is inspired by um, Robert Duaneau's The Kiss. I don't know if you know this famous photograph with two people kissing in Paris. So, so this piece is, is very personal and it's very expressionistic in a way. It's all about expressions. Um, so it's always personal stories, you know, of different people. And it's always different. I, I try, I don't like repetition. I, I think it's interesting that everybody's different. Everybody has a different story to tell, a different experience. And so this is one thing I, I would be scared of if, if someone ever told me, all your portraits look the same. <laughs> You know, but I, I don't think so. I don't think that can be when you paint from life and you paint different people. It's never the same, really. There, there may be some, some common traits uh, that come back, you know, certain emotions, but everybody's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I think this would be a great moment, Serge. Let's pull up some of your images and have you share with us uh, some of the specifics about them. Give me just a moment and get the first one up. Okay, yeah. Right. So do you want me to talk about this one? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so this, um, I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, um, so this was a, an, a young woman named Stephanie that I met in New York City. Uh, it's very interesting. The background is actually the Chelsea High Line. And the way we did this is this was done from, I admit that this was done from photos, but then she posed for me in the studio. But we did a photo shoot on the High Line when the High Line was just starting, when there were no tourists at all in New York, on the New York High Line. So it was just the two of us, like I was running around taking pictures, she was posing, and she's posing behind glass. So basically what you see is the reflection of the sky and and she, at the time, she was a performer. She was, a, she was going to many, many auditions on Broadway. Um, and, and she was struggling. She was, you know, what you would call a struggling artist. Uh, you know, and I was just starting as well at that time. So we were both struggling. So, you know, I, maybe I was projecting a little bit of my own experience. Uh, but basically, I feel like for, for her, most artists, you know, in New York City, which is the toughest place to, to succeed, there's some kind of invisible glass that prevents you from breaking through. That, that's, that's how I would interpret this painting. So the ref, what you see, the reflections are basically her dreams, but she's still behind the glass and she's frozen and it's called in vivo, in vitro, you know. Um, but she's about she's about to to uh, to be reborn to to succeed and break through and she did eventually she was a, a singer on the Mamma Mia Broadway musical very very talented singer incredible voice uh, so that's that's her story and that's the story of this painting and it's it's large it's about sixty five by fifty three inches mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I love you there's a little bit of I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry there's a little bit of abstraction in this one too because yeah. the faith is de deconstructed and that's kind of interesting you know it's it's she's almost uh, yeah it's almost cha chaotic really this this image it's a 
you know, she's trying to break through, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. I love you sharing the story behind the surge and the, the rich symbolism um, that you beautifully executed and, and portrayed in this. And, and I love it, you know, it, there's a, um, a beautiful, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, um, you know, ending, so to speak, you know, with, uh, with her breakthrough that, that you were uh, commenting on. And then also sharing that, you know, it also was kind of a uh, mirroring in the sense, as you were saying, um, you know, what you were going through at that particular time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. And here we have the one from the Cultural Council Art Acquisitions Exhibit. So this, this was the, I, I'm, I mean, I'm very honored that they used this image for the poster of the show and in every outlet, every magazine, every postcard, the culture, I have to thank the Cultural Council and Jessica Ransom for this. And, you know, it's very, very nice of them to, very honored that they chose this piece. Now, I think this, I think this man deserved all this attention. This was, um, this was a superintendent of the building where I was living in Paris. And uh, he became my friend. He was a super also of the building. Uh, the funniest thing about this image is that, you know, I've had people from heritage auctions who looked at this and said, oh yeah, we do a lot of Southwestern art, but the guy is actually French. <laughs> so he, he posed for me and I asked him for, well, would you like to dress as? And he said, oh, I love American culture. So I'll, I'll just bring a, like an American outfit. But this was actually, a, this is actually a Frenchman uh, so his story is quite moving. Uh, unfortunately, he, he passed of cancer. He had a very bad cancer, um, but he was a really nice man, um, you know, of modest origin. He was a super in my building, very helpful, very nice guy, uh, you know, always there to help. And, and he's, we spent many hours together for this portrait. This is a very deep, deep portrait. Uh, I think it took, it took at least 20 hours to do this, maybe 25 hours in sessions of three hours each. Uh, it was kind of interesting, the colors on his shirt, you know, these kind of monotonal colored grays, uh, very much like we are's colors, you know, different shades of gray. And so this, his story is interesting. He uh, spent most of his life on, uh, oil platforms in the Gulf, that's what he did. So he's sort of, I mean, the guy was sort of an adventurer, you know, he, he had a rough life. He was working, uh, basically he was working on the ocean on oil platforms in a very unstable region in the Gulf. So, you know, he, so he told me that that was kind of interesting. Um, and also I remember that he, he liked to smoke big cigars. <laughs> That's how I remember. So it always smelled like cigar in the building <laughs> everywhere. And, uh, and I know that he has a son somewhere in France. And, you know, I hope the son enjoys all this to see his dad on all these posters, invitations in the press. Uh, it was also in the shiny sheet, I think, this image. Uh, you know, so it's great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to perpetuate his legacy, you know, show his, show this portrait. Uh, and it's great that it's still uh, at the Culture Council until June 25th. So everyone can see that painting. And it's also, I want to talk about the technique. It's, it's oil and egg tempera. So I use, uh, I, I put a lot, I paint a lot of white in all the paintings. I don't know if you noticed this. It's a very beautiful, uh, unctuous, white it's very sensuous and that's that's oil and tempera it's very three-dimensional uh, i use palette knife to get to create more thickness and so you have this very strong uh, contrast of light and dark and i i that's you know that's what i like about this technique and i think it makes it also very uh, three-dimensional so he, he really pops out of the canvas it's I feel like it's not flat. Then the colors are also uh, are done with with uh, pure pigments. I actually use pigments that I bought in Italy a long time ago. I still have 
the bags of pigments <laughs> from Rome, pigments that they, you know, local artists use to rest, restore churches. These are really fine pigments bought in Rome, Italy. Um, and so I think these colors are very vibrant. You know, the gray is not entirely gray. It's actually slightly purple. Um, yeah. <laughs> And when one looks at this, seeing the, the, the grand attention to detail and um, representational aspects to it, you know, it's, it's amazing. But when I was reading your bio, Serge, you were saying that you really don't consider your work um, photorealistic or, um, you know, hyper natural realistic. You, you seem to like air on more of the expressionistic side. Could you touch upon that for us? Absolutely. Um, I feel like many photorealist paintings, but you know, not everybody is receptive to this and sees this or cares about this. But I really come from a, I feel closer to the you know, European expressionistic movement. Uh, I feel like all these portraits have, there's some emotion coming out of them. Uh, they have expressions. Uh, it's not super clean, you know, like like photorealistic paintings are, like a Richard Estes uh, or the paintings that you see at Louis Louis um, Louis Maisel Gallery. These are not hyperrealistic paintings, and I never they never were meant to be. I actually, you know, I recently I've done some really some cleaner paintings, clean because the, you know you almost don't see the the brush the touch of brushes, but I, I really feel more free when I can paint like this without, you know, without painting an immaculate skin. I, I don't find that interesting really. And I don't want the paintings to be flat and, and have no emotions. It's a, that's, it's a choice. So I, I like painters like, uh, I like paintings like who come from the social realist movement, for example, uh, like, uh, uh, Alice Neal, for example. Uh, I like Andrew Wyatt and, and Jamie Wyatt's work. It's very alive. Uh, this, this is the kind of painting that I like. And of course, all the German expressions, Otto Dix, uh, Max Beckman. Uh, I, I love the School of Paris. I like Balthus, Modigliani, uh, Soutine. I feel like all of these paintings, they're not perfect technically, perhaps, but what does it mean perfect, you know? But they're alive. There's something that coming out of them. There's emotion coming out of them. And that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I feel like today with a projector, with a lot of training, most people can do it. Uh, most people can paint a hyper-realistic painting, really. Most people who go to art school can do it. They just project a photo. Now you have some very good devices to do it. And then you just train yourself to paint without any flaws and <laughs> you know perfect gradients, but to paint from life and you know make it look clean, clean as far as color, not clean as far as the brushwork. If you know if if the color flows, if the expression is right, if it's alive, I feel like you succeeded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing your, your artistic vision with us in addition to your technique and, and process. And it, it's just so fascinating to, to hear you speak about this and that sense of aliveness is important to you and that emotional quality, that emotional essence to kind of like ooze through is important to you. And I also think before we go on to the next image, Serge, uh, kind of going back to what we touched upon in the beginning of the interview, sort of like your humankind, collection of, of presenting um, your portraits, you know, because here you are um, with your friend and also, you know, where you were living and, and bringing that to life. You said that he deserved the, this attention and that this is what you wanted to paint and you wanted to paint it in, in, in what resonated with you and the, the sensual uh, whites and, and the way you want to present skin and, and this and that. And it shows an interesting also, I think balance with um, an artist uh, creating for him or herself, as well as um, your commissioned art pieces, which, which you have many of as well. So it's very interesting to kind of hear 
um, you know, both sides of it from you. Thank you. Amazing. And I have to say, standing in front of it um, during the uh, preview at the Cultural Council is absolutely an amazing experience. Thank you very much. All right. So here we have this one, which is actually behind you that you mentioned early on. So, um, so this was, <laughs> I get a lot of questions with this one. So I started drawing very young. Uh, I started drawing at four four years of age. Uh, when I was little, I, I was living um, in Brussels at that time. I just came back from America at the age of three and a half. We, we had lived in Boston previously. And in Brussels, um, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and, um, and I, would, I would start watching television as a, as a very young boy. And there were all these war movies and old movies, uh, you know, experimental movies. And one of these movies was the Potemkin battle cruise ship by a movie director called Eisenstein. It was in black and white. And it was about a mutiny on a boat, a mutiny against the Tsar in, the, in 1909, the first Russian revolution. So there was a revolution before the one of 1917. And it was really, uh, you know, it was, it was a propaganda movie. Of course, I didn't understand it when I was little, uh, but I remember these scenes and I would draw from memory all these people fighting. And then I watch a lot of war movies like the Zulus <laughs> in South Africa. And I would watch, I would start drawing at four, five, six and draw thousands of people killing each other. Or this, this were not a child's drawings, that, but that's how I started getting into art. And recently, and this is before this war, this has nothing to do with the war. I did this um, three years ago or two years ago when the COVID started just before. And basically this was very symbolic. This was for me, uh, this, the kids could not go to school. Uh, so this painting is called quarantine. And also the sailors were stranded at sea. And then there was this waves of COVID coming back, wave after wave after wave. So the waves in the back and the storm is basically the COVID. And of course, there was a war looming between Ukraine and, and Russia. Um, and so the, what I did is I, I actually, before, like three years ago, I ordered these costumes from the Russian Navy, from Russia. So these are, these are, sorry. I really try. Okay, it's plugging. I think. Right, it's charging. Okay, so um, what else can I say? It's two brothers, the twin brothers. So it's fraternal love, uh, and you know, it's also a reference to the Potemkin, where they are rebelling against authoritarianism, and th and that's exactly what the young generation is about. You know, they they refuse all this nonsense. You know, they they they're mute. It's there's a mutiny that that's looming. Uh, even when I was in Russia, people were the young generation was was you know you had students in the streets for the last three years. Uh, you know, we forget that, but you know, there are thousands of students who, who disagree with whatever is happening. Uh, this was before the war, even before the war. So you can imagine now. So that's what this painting is about. It's about brotherly love. Also, these boys are half American, half Russian. <laughs> so you, you can see the whole symbolic there and they're fraternal twins. So think about it. I mean, you know, we forget that America and Russia are very similar, actually. They also, they're both Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, they're both, for the most part, the Christian countries. Um, and they're two big empires, basically. And they, you know, they shouldn't like hate each other like this. So that's, this, this is a very symbolic painting. I, I hope people understand children have, are innocent and have nothing to do with conflicts. And they're the first victims, uh, wherever they come from. And, you know, this happens to be my sons. And I hope that later they will appreciate this when they grow up, you know, when they see this painting and, 10, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah, they're just starting their life. They're, they're four years old on this painting. 
-hmm. The same age that I started painting at four years old. Right. right. So there's so much rich symbolism, almost like all across the board, pulling from so many different areas that make up this painting. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, again, I'm using, you can see the oil and neck tempera, the white, you know, it's very nice lights in there in that painting, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the water or the costumes, it, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me to work with oil and neck tempera. And there's also a lot of palette knife in there, a lot of thickness, uh, but it's a very, also a painting where you have a lot of contrast, again, in dark and light. Mm -hmm. And do you know many artists within your circles that are using the oil and egg talent no, today? I don't know any. I actually know. I know there's um, there's a Russian artist here that you that can paint with oil with egg tempera, but not oil and egg tempera. It's mm -hmm. different. It's very different. Um, egg, um, egg tempera is a water based technique, but oil and egg tempera is a technique used by German expressionists, and that's I go back and forth. I use both oil mediums and uh, water mediums. But because I'm a chemist, I know how to make all these emulsions. You know, I, I'm familiar with all this. It's like, it's, it's basically like cooking, like making bechamel sauce, you know, or omelets. And, and unfortunately it does smell like rotten eggs sometimes after I work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's very interesting. It's, it's really like cooking or, or chemistry, what I'm doing. It's, it's sort of, it's very experimental. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the medium is not done well and I can't really work with it. So I have to redo it. Sometimes the medium uh, it starts smelling like rotten eggs and I, I know I can't use it. Sometimes you have mold. I mean, anything can happen. It's, it's, a, it's always, it's always a experimental. It's always a laboratory, my studio. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that, that whole like, experimental laboratory. You really bridge, Serge, the, the artist and the scientist. The al it's alchemy, you know, and that's what it used to be. It used the first painters were chemists. The Van Eyck brothers who invented oil painting, they were chemists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were as much scientists as they were artists. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we have one more to take a look at. So tell us what's going on with this, Serge. So this was an, that's a great experience for me too. And there's actually a documentary about this man. Um, his name is Herb Kraus. He's, um, he's a Vietnam vet, as, as you can tell. And what I did is I, um, this is a detail of the painting. The background is actually from a photograph that he lent me from his years in Vietnam. And these are typical Vietnamese boats in the background. So what I did is I, I painted him as he is now. He's in his 80s, um, but in his uniform from Vietnam. So it's basically a projection from now to 1968, uh, 1966, sorry, that's when he was based in Vietnam. 1966 is also the year when I was born, coincidentally. Um, and so, and this guy, you know, he's a, he's a very nice man. He's an important man too. He, he um, Palm Beach resident. He's on the board of the American Humane Society also. This is a painting that he commissioned me to do, to leave a legacy, to tell his story of, you know, as a Vietnam veteran to his family, to leave something for his family. That's why he commissioned me this painting. Many, many, I have many clients who actually, uh, you know, they want to leave something for their family, they want to tell their story. And so they commissioned a portrait from me uh, to leave something for the family and to tell them what happened, what to tell them about their lives. So he's still very involved um, with the, uh, the, Viet the veteran hospital, for example, which he helps, he helps uh, young veterans who have PTSD. Uh, this painting is called those who have seen war never stop seeing it. And, you know, basically it's about trauma. It's about the war and that you never really forget about it once you've seen it. Uh, when he was telling me about his experience, he had tears in his eyes sometimes. 
And he showed me many pictures from this, this year in Vietnam. Uh, it was a very moving experience. Uh, there is a, a documentary about him on my website also. Um, it's made by a famous uh, film director called Robert Adanto. Uh, and it's about six minutes long. It's on, it's on my homepage, I think, in the video section, in the media section, sorry. Uh, what else could I tell? Again, it's, you know, it was interesting to play with uh, oil and egg tempera. There's a very nice contrast again in light, a very bright light. Well, the way I did this, uh, I actually went with him on the beach, which was similar to the beach that he went to in Vietnam. So, but we went to the beach in Palm Beach. <laughs> it's a different beach, <laughs> totally different, but it's the same climate, really, it's the same light. So we took many photographs in his uniform, uh, you know, people were giving us strange looks, of course, and what's going on there. <laughs> and, and then from these 100 photographs, uh, we picked one and then I did this portrait. And of course, it's somebody that I know. So he's a neighbor uh, in my building. And so, you know, we already knew each other. He, his wife is also a very famous um, gallery director. She, she, she used to... Um, she worked, used to work for Metro Pictures in New York City, which is a major gallery. So his wife is a very, very big art dealer. So they collect art, they know about art. Um, you know, they have some pretty big artists in their collection. And I'm very proud to be in their collection as well. What beautiful and rich stories and symbolism in so many areas uh, as we've been touching upon that, that you pull from to create your breathtaking portraits. Thank you. Yes. I, I, I like to, I think, uh, you know, I, I think some of my paintings could be called conceptual, mm -hmm. conceptual figurative art. I think that's how they should be called. I don't know if they should be called humanistic or conceptual. It's either one of the two. You know, the, the terminology is different here in America than it is in Europe. Like for example, expressionistic doesn't mean much in the US. So a friend of mine, um, uh, Debbie uh, Cole Dobe said that the works were hyper naturalistic, which is not hyper realistic, it's hyper naturalistic. So it's about, humankind but it's humanistic but i really i feel close to the you know maybe the social realist painters or the uh, expressionist painters in europe you know even though maybe it's softer than many expressionist paintings you know a lot of expressionist painters are harsh uh, you know they treat people i mean it's pretty rough sometimes almost satirical and I, I don't think my work is satirical at all. I, I, th I don't think so. I think it's very compassionate, uh, but it's also real. You know, it's, it's a reality. Yes, absolutely. While we still have a few moments, you have had a hallmark moment that I would love for you to share with us with the uh, commission piece with the Palm Beach Day Academy. Oh. <laughs> Could you share that with us? Of course, I, I want to see if I can find that picture, unless you're going to show it. Um, let me see. Uh, where is it? Um, yeah, I was, so I was commissioned a, a large portrait by Palm Beach. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, can you see it? Uh, I was commissioned this big portrait to do uh, of Professor Ralph Greco, who is a star at Palm Beach Day Academy. And he's taught there for 50 years. I never met the guy. This was a complete surprise. They had a, a big, 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 big live auction at the Centennial Gala for the school. This is a very prestigious school. It's the only private school on the island of Palm Beach. Um, and so it was very prestigious also to be commissioned by the school, of course. So. This was in the making for a long time because there was a COVID. The, the gala was postponed twice. So I actually started working on this painting a year and a half ago. <laughs> but it, and it was frustrating because the painting was ready. 
but the gala was postponed and the live auction was postponed. And it was a complete surprise. It was an unveiling. So the professor, no one in the assistant knew about this painting before it was actually unveiled at the gala. So first people would live auction, they would bid on trips to Italy or, you know, the usual stuff like, uh, you know, a residency in Switzerland. Or... But this was a first for the school to actually have a, a portrait live auction. And it was a gamble, you know, because they commissioned it to me. So it wasn't a donation per se, even though I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I charged it was decent what I charged. It wasn't very expensive for the work, but it was not a, you know, a complete donation like the rest of it. So it was a gamble and I'm very thankful that the school took this chance and they, they did very well. They, this piece was auctioned and it brought $60,000 to the school to have this portrait permanently displayed. So it, it didn't even go to the people who bid on it. It was really amazing. So it went for $60,000 to the school. And so now they can display it permanently in the library. I hope they will, I think they will. They're very happy with the portrait. So I, I don't know where they're gonna display it, but they had said initially in the school library on Seaview Avenue in Palm Beach. Uh, so I hope to see it soon. And it's just something that I can do for every charity organize, organization, in, you know, whether here in New York or in Hamptons, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy. I really, you know, I brought, <laughs> it brought a lot of money to the school. I, it was a gamble and, and it was all through this painting. And I'm, you know, I'm very humbled by this. I mean, I, I can't believe this happened, but it did. And so uh, let's see what happens. I mean, I, I already approached other organizations with the same concept. I think what was great was that it was an unveiling. So the professor was invited on, on the stage and then they unveiled it and then it was auctioned. So it was really cool. You know, it was, everyone was, oh, ah, <laughs> when they took the veil off. And so that, so it's really, I see it as a performance, you know, this can be done. I would love to do this for, I don't know, the American Humane, a uh, surprise portrait of somebody they like or, cancer society, I don't know, you know, there's so many possibilities, but um, it's a small investment, but it, it can be a huge benefit for the organization decides to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. What a wonderful achievement. Congratulations on this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that we haven't touched upon within your art and your artistic journey that you'd like to touch upon? So I'm doing a, I'm going to have a solo exhibition um, at the Cultural Council in January of 2023, January, February. And this will be a, a whimsical and more contemporary take on, um, on Flagler and, and the Gilded Age. Yeah. So I can't tell more than that, but it's, it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be interesting. It's mm -hmm. going to be very colorful and Many people of Palm Beach will recognize themselves in these paintings. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now. It's, 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 I think it's going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm sure. It sounds very exciting. As we get ready to close the interview, Serge, I'm wondering with your vast experience, your immense talent and skill, would you be able to speak to the painters that are watching this? How would you advise them? I, I would tell them to, you know, listen to their heart and never give up when, because when I, at the beginning of my career, I met, you meet many people who try to break you, who try to discourage you for X, X, Y, Z reasons. And usually it's jealousy, most, most of all. And they don't recognize talent. They don't encourage it you know, because they're, they're insecure or they're jealous. So I, I would say that, you know, young painters don't listen to people who try to discourage you. Um, you know, you have to be also very disciplined. That's very important. You have to be dedicated. You have to find the time, you know, you have to, you just have to find the time to work. Uh, you know, I, 
I sacrificed many vacations for my art in the beginning. Uh, I didn't have a family life, now I do. I have a beautiful wife, I have wonderful children, but I, I didn't have this for a long time. And that's because I was really focused on producing and working and also trying not to imitate other artists. I mean, you have to find your own, your own voice. You can still be a figurative painter, but you can still find your own voice. And you also try to work from life as much as possible because a photo will only take you so far. Those are such wonderful closing comments. And I love that to work from life, kind of like coming full circle here, which, which you do, which, you know, which is not something that takes place uh, so often now, but you really kind of vibe off that energy of the person and, and getting into all the different emotional, psychological, soul energy to really bring that to life in, in your beautiful and amazing portraits. And that was such great advice. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Thank you so much, Leslie, for having me. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Before we close out, Serge, can you let us know how we can stay connected with you, your social media connections and whatnot? Uh, so my, so I, I actually have a brick and mortar location. Um, I'm on Antique Row, the Antique Row district. I'm at 3636. 30, sorry, 3636 South Dixie Highway mm -hmm. on, on the second floor above Churchill Antiques or, or close to the restaurant Bell and Maxwell or Nomad. So you can find me there. You could, but you can, should I give my phone number? I, I don't know if I can give my phone number online. Maybe not, right? <laughs> uh, well, well, just I'll stay with the, uh, the kind of the brick in the mortar and then your social yeah. media connection. Yeah, social media. So my Instagram page is uh, Palm Beach Premier Portraits. Palm Beach Premier Portraits. You can find me on Instagram. It's my Facebook page is Serge Strasberg. And uh, my website is www Palm Beach Premier Portraits. So that's that's how it's spelled, mm -hmm. right? And what else could I tell you? I mean, I'm I'm very accessible. You know, you can send me a message on Instagram, or Facebook, um, or on the website. Um, I'm always happy to share insights or meet new people. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> I'm also looking for uh, I'm also looking for models. Also, I need you know I'm always looking for live models. Mm -hmm. If if anyone is listening, poses for artists. Yes, yes, great. Thank you for adding that, Serge. It has been amazing to connect with you. Thank you for sharing these stories connected in with your artwork, with your um, rich history of all that you bring in as an artist, as a scientist, um, as a very skilled portrait painter, and what's important to you in your artistic vision and how you view things and your mind and your heart connection through your art. You've shared so much with us. Thank you so much and continued success. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Liz. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching Art and Talk today as we kick off officially our first artist from the art acquisitions exhibit currently held at the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County. So if you are local to South Florida or just passing through, you'll definitely want to check that out. You can jump on our Facebook page, Art and Talk, and you'll find two links. One is an art uh, video uh, exhibition, a video exhibition of the space. And there's also a link to the Cultural Council website where you'll get a list of all the artists that are exhibiting, and you also find a little bit more information on that as well. All right, so again, thank you so much for watching today. Stay connected with us on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, and we'll talk soon on the next Art and Talk. Until then, be well and be blessed. Bye-bye.